Okay. All right, Pete. All right. You're on. Thank you. Pete Hurth with Bodwin, surveying and engineering, the engineer on the project. I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can. I know we've been here for nine hours now. Um, what I'll do first is just quick run through any testimony I heard and try to rebut it. And then if you guys have questions, feel free to hit me right after I'm done here. So one of the things from both meetings combined here, uh, the sidewalks, you know, a lot of talk about it. I think this project is a good catalyst to get those sidewalks actually done. I think if the project does not go, those sidewalks are still a good idea. So this may be a good way to, to get the town and the, and the locals to uh, team up on that thing. Bagnell Road, again, this project I think is the catalyst to uh, get that improvement made, to 90 that up. The town has the property. I stood out there again today and, and looked at it, looked both ways as far as sight distance and contemplated that 90 degree turn and, and uh, it would be a great improvement to do that. So I think, again, this project makes that a, a, a priority to keep bugging the DOT and figure out how to get that done. Again, the DOT has the final say in any improvements there. The accident data is what they typically go by. Obviously, town can persuade one way or the other. When you are parked at that angle, it would be a lot better to see to your right, so looking south, if it was 90 up. I think that's a good argument to make with the DOT, and I think if they stood there, they would agree to go ahead with that project. So I'm hopeful that will happen. Uh, safety, I did check with the Door County Sheriff's Department. Uh, in the last five years, they said they've only had four accidents within a thousand feet of that, and all four were deer strikes, nothing uh, vehicle to vehicle. Four accidents in five years? Right, and all within a thousand feet of that intersection on the highway. But that's not with the kind of traffic that we're talking about. Right, it, it was deer strikes. It was car hitting the deer. Um, again, thing, things that that the Loritzens are okay with doing, and I think it's a great idea, and you know, this information is all great. Certainly we can do a sign at the exit that says, turn right with your rig, see if people find, find that way to split, split up the traffic. Uh, there is room within our site to stack. Obviously somebody's not gonna pull on the Bagnell. If Bagnell's got a car waiting, they'll go already. So we've got room to stack vehicles leaving and entering our, our facility. We've got the long driveway. Um, they can provide maps, suggesting ways to get in and out of the thing. Uh, some good comments tonight about bike, bike paths. If Certainly a statement saying don't send your kid on the highway with a bike would be a great thing to say. There's obviously different ways to get down to Cape Point Drive, it sounds like. So, you know, again, it's a lot of what, what we hear tonight is this is going to happen, this is going to be terrible, this is going to happen. You know, from a safety standpoint, Lake Michigan is there, and there's hundreds of houses along Lake Michigan. People, you're not going to put a fence along Lake Michigan. You're not going to stop kayaking. You're not going to... At, at some point, it's up to the people using Door County to protect themselves. Right. It's not the Loretzen's job. It's not this board's job. Obviously, safety is great. We, we can do everything we can to improve it, but at some point, we do what we can. Speaking about safety, um, how about acceleration and deacceleration lanes on both sides? Because I want to tell you, you know, they're going to start stacking up heading north, coming out. That's they can feed out easily. But right, and, and I understand where the DOT is coming from because they're stacked in front of two, them too many times. And my job, Mr. Young, is to move traffic, not to right. slow it down. And and I'm tired of hearing that. They got to take <coughs> the bull by the horns and think about safety. Yeah, absolutely, and that that is, it's a frustration of the DOT, and that and that's just, you're right. Their job is to move traffic, and uh, to warrant a turn lane there. They're going to tell me, we need accident data. And unfortunately, that's the way it is. Well, I think it's important uh, here. We have a <coughs> an obligation to the citizens 
besides the owners and everything that people come in there is to get safety. If, if the DOT isn't going to do it, it's going to happen. No different than what happened with the Sweden. Mm -hmm. DOT said no. And we had to do it. Right. So, from my perspective, that's how I'm going to look at it. Right. And and a more recent one, like I explained last time, the gas station north of Carlsville. We went in with the thought of, hey, we're going to put turn lanes in, and DOT said, no, you don't need to. That's a town road. Same story here. The difference between Little Sweden and here is Begnell Road is a town road. Little Sweden was a private driveway. So, so there is a difference there. You know, Harbor Village is a private driveway onto a highway. If your ultimate access point is a town road, it's a little different situation, but well, let's see. I mean, but it, but again, I you know I I have no problem if the the town has 150 people sign a petition that says, "Hey, DOT, the town has spoken. We need a turn lane here. Let's submit well, that to the DOT and see if you get any get any traction from it." I well, don't know. well, I think what John is suggesting is that this board may offer that as a condition, may. Right, but I, I'm not so sure if I went to the DOT and said I'm putting in a turn lane, they'd say okay. So you may be giving us a condition that we cannot satisfy. Well, we phrased one before in a similar situation that didn't mandate, but mandate, mandated certain actions to explore the possibility, right? Yes. <clears throat> That's correct. Okay. Um, moving on, I guess jump in whenever you'd like. Uh, Environmental concerns is another thing, obviously, a lot of talk. Uh, there's statements that septic systems are bad. My opinion is opposite of that. I, I do believe strongly in the industry I'm in that uh, there's too much overreaction to let's, send their, let's run sewer pipes to everybody in the world and septic systems are terrible. Septic systems are not terrible. Everybody probably on that map is either on a holding tank or a septic system. We're not hearing about neighbors' wells that are contaminated. Nobody's getting ill. Septic systems work. There's private wells and septic systems throughout this community. It's working. Ours is the same. It's a larger scale. We have deeper soils than many of the places here. If you're on a mound system, we have better soils. We have more provisions in there to monitor our system. If you're a private system, you have every three years, you have to pump it or have somebody do an inspection that says your solids level are not at a third of the tank. As part of our state approval, we have to submit a management plan that got approved from DSPS. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's a three-page management plan that talks about each tank. Um, for example, the, the 12,000 gallon septic tank, we have to assess the operating condition twice a year. We have to measure the sludge level, level in that tank. If it exceeds a third of the volume, we have to have it pumped. We have to have the effluent filter removed and cleaned two times annually. The dose tank, we have to assess the operation of the tank every year. We have to, when the volume of scum and sludge is one t 10 inches deep in the bottom, the contents need to be pumped. And this is something that is part of the approval and the county sanitarian's office has jurisdiction to make sure we do this. So. I failed to mention this last time, but this is part of the state approved plan. Um, there's influent sampling and there's effluent sampling required. The effluent samples are required for BOD, total suspended solids, total col coliform, coliform. Uh, grab samples taken from the dose tank samples semi-annually for the first year and submitted to DSPS annually after the first year. So we'll have a good gauge on systems working, systems not working. Is there anything that needs to be tweaked in the system? But certainly there is, there is a plan, and it includes in a contingency plan that says if it's not working, a pretreatment device can be implemented, or pump and haul like a holding tank can be implemented. So there are provisions in here that hold us to make sure we have an operating system that's environmentally sound. Okay, because of the various testimonies that we've heard from some of the experts who were here last, night before last, uh, with this, let's call it the the, the odor, the odorizer, fertilizer, whatever it is. Uh, what if 
they're wrong. Okay, so to, to comment on the additive, um, as a background, this additive issue, it's out there. It is not on the forefront of my septic system industry. Uh, I'm, our company is members of WALRO, which is the Wisconsin Onsite Wastewater Recycling Association. We've been members of that for since I worked there and never, hit, never heard of this. We've designed a lot of campgrounds, um, prisons, everything, and we haven't heard of this as being an issue. Not, not that it's not. I, I, I've done the same Google research everybody else has. Also attended three out of the last four Wisconsin Association of Campground Owners Conventions. It's a huge convention. All the owners come together. They have speakers. I did a, I did, I did a talk on septic systems. Um, they have speakers, lawyers there about liability and it, vendors, everything. It's the big. It's a really big convention. Never heard any of this. And I did talks on septics. I said if you have a problem with your septic, come to Pete's speech at two o'clock on Tuesday. And nobody showed up saying, "Oh my God, these." So the, it's an issue, but I don't think it's reared its head. John Teichler has never heard of it at the county. Um, Talked to Chris Olson today from the county, another sanitarian. He hasn't heard of it. He hasn't heard of failing systems. He hasn't heard of contaminated wells. So again, I, you know, I can read some things from the research. One thing I highlighted here, it just says, although these risks exist, a study by Novak shows that campgrounds in Virginia with seasonal occupation show no signs of septic tank failure. And a study by Pearson shows that a septic tank will have a lot of problems with large amounts of formaldehyde, zinc, and phenol but these large amounts are not realistic and the septic tanks still manage to go back to normal within two days. You know, take that for its worth. It's something I googled. RV Trader magazine had a, just an article on it. Um, one company that offers consumers a wide range of more environmentally friendly RV toilet chemicals and related products is Thetford. Well, Thetford's the one the guy said that's the, the evil one that just has formaldehyde. So. You know, they sell a line of holding tank deodorants that meet strict environmental standards for toxic toxicity, biosafety levels, biodegradability. Their formaldehyde-free formulas also perform on par with conventional formaldehyde containing deodorants. So again, it gets down to let's offer the good stuff in our gift shop, let's educate the campers that come in, and let's try to do our part, but I think to say Septic system is not going to work because somebody Googled formaldehyde's bad is a, is a stretch. I don't think they're saying, this. well, there are, there are some folks that are saying that, that it, it will destroy the septic system. But the concern that I've picked up from this is what, uh, this is a chemical. We're not doing a real good job of regulating chemicals right now, mm -hmm. in, my, in my opinion. And we don't know uh, if it's going to pass through the, the field and into the, the water table. Uh, like caffeine and pharmaceuticals and, and mm -hmm. other um, additives that we've, uh, we've discovered from, from the tests. Right, and, and not to get into too much detail, but a big thing in, in the septic industry is you don't want to, you do it, you have to pre-treat and do some, but it is, you do not want to put a medical clinic on a septic system because of all the, all the um, pharmaceuticals. pharmaceuticals that people are taking. You don't want to it's tricky at a at an uh, elderly housing thing. It's hospitals. It's so there's concerns about what kills the bugs, what doesn't kill the bugs in your system. You know, again, we're going we're going through 12,000 gallon septic, 5,000 gallon dose. We're metering it. We're sending it to a field that's way oversized for what's actually going there, and we're sending it through anywhere from three to five feet of soil that a soil test just told us will give us the adequate treatment before it reaches any kind of constraint, which in this case was the was rock. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we don't know if this chemical is going to pass through that whole thing in, into the groundwater. Right, and and again, I think that the answers from the research I've done are dilution, and by having this, the sewer pipes hooked up to thirty-seven percent of our sites, I think we're we're doing something to help that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you can educate and, and sell the right product in your gift shop, you, you're maybe catching half of them. Um, would, would uh, is a holding tank uh, a reasonable um, right? So, route? so it, it, it 
the way this the current rules are written in the county is if you have the opportunity to put in a system that is not a holding tank the county requires you to and that's even for a commercial operation yes okay. so it would be a stretch to to convince the county jeff you made but they're going to want they're going to want the at grade that's a great system you're not going to put in a holding tank if you have the opportunity you know the other thing is you have a holding tank now you've got a whatever 3,000 gallon pumper truck pulling in and out of there twice a day during weekends and busy times and traffic and highway and mm -hmm. air brake and to be able to handle our, our wastewater on site in the method that we're proposing is in my opinion the only way to go that uh, five feet was it was a five feet of Is it going to be really cost? Nothing's cheap, I understand that principle. But to replace that five feet when it gets saturated? It, it, would, it would not fail at that. It, typically, when a septic system fails, it fails at the, it, it creates a mat, is what happens if you have too many organics. So typically, in an accurate system, if you would say system failed, it's rare, but if you would, you could certainly scrape off the, the top foot with the stone and the pipes and replace those on, on the soil and just let the soil dry out. So it wouldn't be a situation where all six feet is unsuitable for anything. Um, again, it's seasonal. Uh, it's going to rest for half the year. It's going to dry up every year. Maybe. Oh, it will. <laughs> um, you know, again, getting back to the, the some of the questions in that regard it, none of our water lines are going to be buried for for winter use so there it, it's got to be empty f it's going to be not be used in winter all the lines will be blown out the well is going to be shut off it's going to be dead okay so actually there, there won't be anybody here in the winter time is what you're saying right right well that's unfortunate what about, uh, what about uh, backup uh, electricity in the event of it? Right, I, and we did, I did discuss that with the owners. They do have a generator picked out, so that's a non-issue. You know, it, my original rebuttal was going to be if the electricity is out, the well pump doesn't work, you're not using water anyways, so your septic system doesn't have to work, but... It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, so no, yeah, they, they do have plans for a, a backup generator. You know, if, if you talk about long-term outages, if I pull into a campground and they say we're going to be out of electricity for three days, okay. I'm probably leaving. And the pumps that are going to be moving this effluent, are they grinder pumps? No, nope, they're uh, effluent pumps. So they're three horsepower effluent pumps, four of them with redundancy in case one would break or one field and needs to get rested. So explain, I asked that Tuesday night. But explain to me again, how are you going to stop the, daper, the diapers and the we, and we have a, a effluent filter that has one eighth inch, <coughs> uh, only anything smaller than an eighth inch can only fit through it on the end of the septic tank. Okay. So the liquids get into the dose tank are clear liquid. So that'll be a daily cleaning? No, no. Those, it's uh, same as at, at residential house, they have effluent filters. You clean them a couple times a year. It doesn't clog like that. They're bigger. That it's based on gallons per day, so the <coughs> two will be talk, big. Have you talked to um, Gibraltar Sanitary System? No. Uh, engineer down there? No. Just ask him the question. Uh, well, yeah, and and, and then get back to me <laughs> because sure. that what you just said. It's a weekly, really daily problem. Okay. Yeah, and municipal you know, systems they have. stupid, but they. But they'll flush anything that they can down the toilet. Right. And that's what's happening. Sure. Just uh, call Bill Wedding. Do you know Bill yep. Wedding? Yeah, sure. And ask him that question. Right. And, and at a municipal system, you see more of that. They have screens at the intake of, of larger, you know, city of Sturgeon Bay stuff that, yeah, I've heard lots of stories. Um, back to the holding tank versus septic. A lot of com most communities we work in actually will not allow us to plant a new lot on a holding tank. They require us to prove to them that we can have a mound system or better. So it certainly is a acceptable thing throughout the industry. Is holding tanks are 
form of last resort. But not to be <coughs> shooting you down, my friend, but remember we're dealing with a chemical that we don't have in my holding tank or my mound system in Gibraltar. Or if I don't know what you're on, you're you're probably on I'm on septic. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna accurate at home. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's gonna be a different ball game. Right, and again, we're going to be metering, we're going to be monitoring it. You know, there's, there's safeguards in place. Um, I don't know how much more to expand on it. We've, we've got the state approval. We've designed in, in excess of the size we need. We've got greater than the minimum separation. And we have a maintenance plan that says we have to make sure it's working. So to, uh, to expand a little bit just on the, the one, one thing that I caught is the farmland. This is zoned ag and it's <coughs> maybe should be preserved as ag. And you know, that NR151, I don't know if you guys have been brought up to speed on that, but there's a prohibition coming that's gonna not allow you to apply manure to any fields less than two feet of soil. So not that we wanna bog down this proceeding with thinking about that, but man, there's a picture of Door County, everything in red is less than two feet of soil. So when you get to Northern Door, if there's changes that come in, um, you may see people just can't farm. You can't spread manure on it. So what are you going to do? Um, alternative developments and people are going to have to do something if they can't farm that piece of property anymore. And I don't think the answer is you sell up 40 acre chunks to a person who wants to put one house on it. Priest and all the lands eaten up. So th there's definitely some issues there. Um, the site in question has, I, I checked with the soil and water department and they, they do have a history of applying around 10,000 gallons of uh, liquid sewage per acre per year. So you're looking at 200,000 gallons of liquid sewage in a tilled up field. That's where I struggle with is an RV park with grass and is that worse than a 200,000 gallons of raw sewage getting put on 19 inches of soil? So anyways, off my soapbox. Um, blasting, times have changed. It, it's so remote from anybody's home. I can't imagine there's going to be any impact. Uh, Ironically, this morning I got a knock on my door at 7.15 from Polster and said, hey, we're blasting your neighbors across the streets building a basement, we're blasting, so I just have to tell you, okay. So it happens, people blast up here every day. Um, certainly being more than a football field for many neighbors, there's zero percent risk in my mind of impact to a neighbor. Pete, what's the uh, plan for uh, spills of black water? So when, when you say black water, you're, you're speaking of sewage out of somebody's RV, I'm assuming, like they pull the plug. Well, the hose breaks. Right. So they didn't make the connection right, you know. You know the, right. So you're, there's going to have to be a procedure in place. I don't know exactly what that is. Um, at the dump stations, we have it curbed, so if something would spill there, it, it still gets in. It, it isn't a contamination source. Again, I have not heard of major incidents of major spills at campgrounds. Maybe I'm missing something, but... Uh, How will that, uh, the dump area be supervised? Uh, so what, what they'll do is when people pull out, that'll be their opportunity to dump and then the owners have the right to charge them, obviously, if they want to. If they want to include it in their rent, they can. But they would uh, be being supervised from the lobby of the, the gift shop of people pulling up and dumping. So it would be a controlled so if situation. If they're distracted by a customer, um, somebody could dump and have an accident and they wouldn't know it until... 
Right, right. You would assume people are going to report an accident. You know, again, these dump stations are at most campsites, so I think it's a common thing. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you guys have had any instances you know of. of Not that I'm aware of. Uh, quickly to go through safety of ponds, there, there will be no standing water permanently in these ponds. They're designed to drain empty. They're, they're filtration ponds. They've got small outlets. Uh, even if it's the huge storm, they're going to be about two feet deep and they'll soak away. Um, not an issue. Storm water. I do have my uh, charts here that I don't know if you want me to go through them or not, but it, it just does show that the peak flow for every storm event is less after development than, than pre-development. Is there need to go through it? Or? No. Okay. But this uh, storm water is going to run down to the highway and then run north along the highway. Right. Down in town. Okay. Yeah, what, what we have to do and when we do a storm water plan is we have to match so it goes the same spot as it always went and ends up so your peak flows can be modeled based on how long it takes to get there. So that's that's what we do. We we manage it at the end of our property and that's the, the way the rules are written. So okay. uh, I took a look at I know there's complaints about wetness down below. You know, there's there's different soil types down by the beach than there are up by us. Um, you know, all, some of them had two and a half feet to water table. You know, make, that's just part of living down in that area is you have a higher seasonal water table. Um, what else? Let me keep going on my list here. One statement was made that this would be the only one with an access, or the only one other one with an access to the to State Highway, Harbor Village, and Egg Harbor Camping, just north of uh, Wood Market, is has an access on the Highway uh, right. 42 there. And Sherry did find uh, somebody at the accident stats from Jan Shartner at the Door County Sheriff's Office that uh, can only find one accident at that Egg Harbor Campground access that occurred at the entrance to the campground in 2016 and what's pro property damage only, no injury. Trespassers, I heard that. We, uh, we talked about the fence. That seems like a good solution. Upon ex excavation of the property prior to Setting things in place, is that going to be surrounded with silt fence? Yeah, yes, we have an erosion control plan that has okay. tracking pads, silt fence, um, seating guidelines, how long things can be exposed, all that stuff. The, uh, the one thing I can't argue is Miss Navis's uh, accusations of me not being a very good assessor. So I probably was off if they I was looking at total value of what the the investment will be into the project and that's how I came up with that that's probably not a true indication just looking through my old notes when I first wrote that Bailey's Grove has eight thousand dollars in taxes approximately being town nine thousand so I promise not to be an assessor <laughs> if they promise not to be engineers <laughs> just kidding just kidding all right um, getting back to uh, you know the neighbors. I understand there there's small residential lots near this near this site. We can't argue that. Um, you know the carpet shop across the way is not a non -net residential use. Corey Burnshine, just to our west, our biggest neighbor along our biggest lot line, is talking in support of it. You know I know it's a change, but uh, again, the farmland in Northern Door County, we're gonna have to start seeing different uses for it coming up here. I don't know what what's going. On. A little bit about, and I'll keep it brief, a little bit about the, uh, the smart growth plan, the, the county pl comprehensive plan versus the town. Um, I sat on the town of Sevastopol's smart growth plan.
plan when they implemented that back in about the same time period when everybody was up against the clock on that thing. And my understanding, which it's, it sounds like people on the board are more familiar with it than I am, but in Sebastopol, we, we made our plan and we said this is our vision of our, and we did a future land use map. Every town gave that to the county. The county took all that information and put it in one book. Now the narrative in that book may not be consistent for, because every narrative in every town was different, but my understanding is the fact that the town put that box on and said this is our core, that means a lot. It doesn't mean that because the shading underneath it said agriculture, it's supposed to be agriculture. I think that box meant this is where our town's going to grow. Certainly in Sebastopol, we did a similar thing. We drew a circle instead of a square because we didn't want to limit it to, okay, that square is only 100 feet from the intersection. We wanted to put a bubble and say somewhere in this vicinity we want growth. And I, th you know, I think to say <coughs> it's illegal to vote this in because it doesn't match the comprehensive plan. It certainly matches the towns, which was given to the county, which was implemented as a county comp plan. It shows that box. The zoning was given to the uh, owners. You know, that's and that's the frustrating part from, I'm sure, Loritzen's standpoint is, they, they I, th I think, tried to do it the smart way, is they, they didn't hire me until the zoning was in place because for that reason. We don't want to spend money on an engineer and surveying if we're going to get halfway through this and get shut down. So they came to us and said, hey, the zoning was in place. I said, oh, how'd that meeting go? Oh, I don't know. It was pretty good. Okay, awesome. Let's go. We got zoning. Um, met with the county staff and said, what are the setbacks? How many units? Let's make sure everything's good. Put the buffer in. It was, they did it right by getting the zoning in place ahead of time. And to get to the, the last hour and then deny them when they did things right, to me seems, you know, this, this board, either the RPC was totally wrong and the town board's been totally wrong three times, or, and the zoning was wrong, or this is truly what fits into the town's vision. Good arguments on both sides, I understand. Again, you know, one thing, this, this board gets a lot of variance requests, which is geared toward you're supposed to deny them unless there's really, really good reasons. We're, we're not asking for any variances. We meet every stitch of the law, every setback, every density, every permits in hand. We're not asking for anything except for allow us to build it in accordance with the rules and the zoning that we have. I think I spoke my piece. Um, happy to answer questions. Otherwise, can continue. Uh, I've got a couple. Uh, okay. I misspoke earlier because there were a number of things on the uh, uh, general criteria. Well, I'm more on the specific uh, uh, criteria that you addressed. Um, I'm just looking at the general uh, criteria. Um, first question is: Will a project affect the public interest? How would you answer that? Is that same as item one, which mine says enhance and or sustain property values? Is that the same? No, it's no. on the basis of approval. It you know it it, it specifically says uh, will the pro will the proposed use at the proposed location um, will not be contrary to the public interest. Well, that's the big argument. You know, the neighbor to the west said it's okay. He owns 1,300 feet along our border. Carpet one across the street has got commercial zoning. The Loritzens are going to build their own house to the north side. That's three sites covered. The uh, parcel to the east is a pine plantation. Not that it won't change, but that is that the only public interest we're looking at then? <clears throat> no, I'm not saying I'm not saying that. I, you know, I I think again, the the town. The town chairman and the town 
members that sat here, I think, explain how they think it's okay for the public interest. I think they talk about commercial growth in the town. I think they talk about supporting businesses. I think they talk about maybe it is frustrating the town hasn't done much in 50 years. Um, so I, I may not be the right guy to answer that question for you. But that, that's my take on it. Would the use negatively affect the character of the surrounding area? Well, we're doing everything we can to screen it, to put landscape buffer in. We've got some vision blocked by the hill. Um, putting the fence in to prevent trespassers. A any change is going to look different than a farm field. Um, if I was sitting here with a 30-unit apartment building, I'd probably be having the same argument. And then getting to the 14 uh, specifics, um, similarity to other uses in the area, I think you'd say it's a no. Yeah, the only thing in my report, I had uh, eight campgrounds within eight miles. So, depends what your area is. Vehicular and pedestrian access <coughs> pending, I guess. Mm -hmm. Impact on neighborhood fl traffic flow, kind of the same thing, I guess. You know, one, one thing to say about the traffic as I was sitting listening, it's a little different than, you know, Peninsula Players. We have, we have an event Friday night at 8, and it's just packed in, packed out. You know, these are obviously Friday nights, afternoons are going to be busy, Sunday afternoons are going to be busy. But you do have people filtering in and out, different schedules. Um, it's a little different than a concert letting out or something that has more of a designated time frame. So I don't, I don't know if that helps us or not. I mean, these are, these are all things we're supposed to consider when we're right. uh, uh, deciding whether or not to allow a, a CVP or, because um, we're, kind of, we're supposed to start from scratch. Uh, so I see some gaps here, that's my comment. Okay, any other questions for Pete at this time? All right, Pete, thanks very much. You've been you. thorough and appreciate you being here both nights. Super important. I'll be back Tuesday, <laughs> just to watch. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to offer um, testimony um, in rebuttal? On that side? Last chance. Okay. <coughs> Other side. <laughs> and let's try to keep it brief if we can. So I know everybody's tired and, and I... Oh, I only okay. have uh, 20 pages to go through. You cut it down. No, actually, uh, that is just uh, more or less notes from the last time I was here. I'm Craig Nelson. Yes, I realized that everything is uh, under the list and everything will yes. be true. Okay. No, you don't need to study that. I'm just going to say a couple of remarks. Uh, they're off the they're summaries from that. There were four groups of factors that I said last time that should have been studied and we didn't see it. And they studied and then addressed sustainability, traffic and safety, real estate value, and infrastructure. And we've been rehashing those over and over. And council says that uh, that's a symptom of uh, what's being done here not matching the county comprehensive plan. Uh, I want to talk about some secondary effects of those four main things. And these are maybe peripheral. So on real estate value, uh, I mentioned a study that was done by realtor.com that associated <coughs> the concentration of rental properties in metropolitan areas with residential property values and I said they had come up with a statistical correlation regression of 14 percent and that property value would decline in value overall by 14 percent. Well we don't know. We didn't do that study. That's the problem. There wasn't one done here. The fact is one was done nationally in other contexts though, and that's the kind that should have been done here. 
we do have an example of one live real estate transaction that took place under our nose, uh, where the value went down instantaneously in the middle of the transaction just by mentioning the proposed RV project. Anecdotal. Yeah, I didn't. Under, I understand. didn't get that. No. I didn't get that conclusion. Wasn't that conclusion? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, oh, something I heard let, let that pass. Let that go. Then. Okay. Uh, the the prospect of real estate value changing is, is on everybody's lips and mind. That's what we're. I'm very concerned about, and that's an issue that affects everyone. Uh, everyone in Jacksonport. I, I don't know how much it will affect it. Uh, I'm not an expert in that, but if we assume that there is some, you've got to just say, what if? What if that happens? And what if by some factor? And if it does, then it affects the entire uh, residential real estate. Uh, so that ultimately has a secondary effect, of course, um, in that ultimately it's going to affect I don't know how the mystical process of valuation uh, by the county is done, but ultimately it shows up in the assessed valuation. Not at the same moment, there may be a time lag and everything else and through some formula. So that's going to affect the actual tax revenues that come in. There's something to think about. Um, and as far as the uh, traffic and transport uh, issues and this bottleneck that's uh, right at the spot that we've gone over and over again, it seems like that could have been uh, evaluated in a rather standard way. And I think there was probably some engineering study that was done right here in Sturgeon Bay or these two places uh, on 57 when they put in the uh, roundabouts. Uh, for the same reason, a big backup of traffic uh, during the peak periods and traffic trying to turn left across it, which always got stagnated. Well, the issue is magnified there because of the acute angle of the turn and the blind spot and everything else. So if they put a roundabout there, it'd be okay? <laughs> well, I wouldn't know what you would do. But, but what I do know is that there needs to be some engineering study that's reasonably standard, and usually a simulation will take care of it. A simulation study that models that traffic pattern, collects the data, and then models in different possibilities, whatever they are. Uh, and again, that wasn't done. Uh, and so again, a what if about all of these sustainability issues. What if the worst happens with water supply, groundwater contamination, water runoff, power grid, uh, hydrocarbon emission uh, increase, uh, uh, particulate matter, uh, air pollution increase? What happens with those things and who uh, covers the cost of that? Isn't there an in industry usually a sinking fund that's established uh, by proponents of development uh, and or insurance to cover such possibilities. How much would the insurance have to be? I don't know. You'd have to, that's what would have to be determined. But I would think that that would be a requirement also <coughs> condition. Uh, and uh, that could be a big number. Uh, if you're talking about money for remediation against any one of these possible disasters, um, and then, I mean, you're talking double-digit millions, maybe triple-digit, as far as you know, $100 million insurance policy. Um, let's see. Um, then, is there a guarantor in case the proponent goes insolvent? Uh, and we're left with these issues. Uh, that's not quite the same as the insurance because the insurance doesn't necessarily apply if somebody goes bankrupt. Then what happens? And RV parks aren't a sure thing economically. I don't know what they did in terms of their cash flow modeling and planning. I'm sure they went over a hundred different contingencies, but um, who knows if they're valid. And um, this is, after all, a seasonal business. Mr. Nelson, mm -hmm. what kind of insurance are you talking about? Pardon me? What kind of insurance are you talking about that you 
Talking about liability insurance? Yes, kind of exactly. A liability against all of these different things. You know, groundwater contamination. How much is the cost to clean that up? Can you clean it up? Well, typically there's a pollution exclusion on a liability policy, and most liability policies are written on an occurrence basis, so... Then it's a self-insurance of some kind. I mean, who is well, going to... pollution? Who? pollution is... Um, yeah, pollution is not a normally an insurable peril. How, how is it... I'm just raising the issue. Somebody has to allow for it, and someone's going to have to pay for that. No. And who puts up that? Are you saying that's going to be left to just the community to take on in the, the what if case? Well, it, 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 I guess yes, yes I am. I mean, there's a, there's a risk to most everything going on in, in communities where pollution is, a, is an issue and, and, and uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm just talking from an insurance standpoint. The, they're, the, they're, they're, they're not going to be able to, to purchase pollution insurance. I, th I think they, the, the party that's responsible is the party that's responsible, period. They propose that they're going to put up something and it causes that pollution and they are the ones responsible. And they own it until it's cleaned up. Well, it, what, what, what happens if you are, have an at-fault accident and you maim the hand of a, of a dentist or a doctor and the, the lawsuit is for $10 million and your, your limit is a million dollars? Who's responsible for the nine million dollars? Well, I, I don't. I, I, then they need to have uh, sufficient, whatever it is, sufficient, some kind of. Uh, well, what's fund. sufficient? I mean, that, I don't know. I'm just raising the point. Okay. I'm just Joe off the street. Okay. And as a well, citizen, I understand, but I'm just. I mean, to me, you have to define. I mean, you know, and I'll ask the question. I mean, I understand your study about the 14 percent decrease based on rental. I didn't read the study, but to me, rental is long-term rental, not weekly occupancy of a, of a campground. Do they define what rental included? Does that include camping specifically or how do they define rental? I understand what you're saying. Okay. Uh, you've got to get finer to it. And I didn't say to hang your hat on the 14. I said that kind of study should have been okay. done here and it wasn't. And, and then I'll ask this of, of Rick or Jeff. I mean these studies that you want to have done, I mean, is, is, who do you want to have that do that? The county or state or the applicants? The proponent needs to do pay for this. The county should authorize it and commission it with an independent, all of these need to be done by independent people. They can't be done by the proponent, but the proponent needs to finance it. Yeah. Well. I understand what you're saying. I, I don't necessarily see that as being okay. feasible, but I understand what you're saying. All right. Well, this is, again, I'm just a guy off the street who happens to have property as, as up we, as here. As we all are. I'm very, as, as we all are. Well, and everybody, not only, it's not only just me and the people who are opposing this, all the people who are actually proposing it and are in favor of it on real estate. And the real estate value issue is critical to them, too. Everybody should want to answer that question. I don't disagree. We're all in that same boat. We all own real estate and live here. I know. Um, and then the last thing is uh, precedent. So we already alluded to uh, Carpet One across the street, which is zone commercial. And so if this... I don't think it's zone commercial. I'm sorry, what? It's not it's zone not commercial. commercial. Well, well, why was Carpet One then uh, addressed? You know, that doesn't anything to do Okay, never, or forget that then. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to sidetrack it. Um, so if, if we agree to this permit, then um, that would allow for, uh, say at another time, an expansion if they wanted to, citing the, if they could say that we can afford it and if they could get the land and if this one went through, then they said, well, we would like to, you know, buy, expand. I don't think we can uh, work with pres precedents. Uh, no, we're not precedent setting. Okay. All right. Saying. Well, okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you for listening, and okay. thank you for giving me a little bit of feedback while I'm here. All thank right. Thank you, 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 thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Is anybody tired? <laughs> <laughs> Carol Ann Osinski, <laughs> 4130 Bagnell Road. I'm going to take one minute. All right. I want to give you a visual. I just want to address the landscape buffering.
the number of trees, the spacing of the trees, and the height of the trees. If you will bear with me and look over here. Is this about two feet? Okay, mm -hmm. sure. What? Black is yeah. taller. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's making a point. Yeah. Tall trees. These are 12, these are a foot. Just oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two foot tall trees. I am hard pressed to believe that this will create a visual barrier in five years. In 10 years, I would say we'd be lucky if it'd be 20 years. In our backyard, about 22 years ago or longer, we planted trees anywhere from, like they were about this tall, this tall. It's over 25 years ago. We are now, we now have a few that are like this and like this. That's all I have to say. Okay, it works. Thank you. By the way, you're not the first person to paste things off in this room. I'll leave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> Counselor. I think I'm last. I yeah. will be as mercifully brief as I possibly can. Right. I just want to leave you with a few thoughts again. Again, uh, I can't stress enough that. You know, just a vision for what you want is not planning. Very different things, and planning is not what's going on here. Uh, most importantly, the planning aspect that has not gone on here is the infrastructure necessary to serve development is not something you put off for the future. If it's needed to be for safety, you need it along with the development. Some way, somehow, the, the pedestrian issues, the turn issue, that's not something that you, you put in the development that requires these things to be done and then you just hope that somehow it's gonna come together, especially when you see some very potentially significant challenges that need to be overcome. Those issues need to be resolved before this would ever go forward. Also, I, I again wanna dispel this notion that somehow this, you know, this needs to be the wild west at this campground for it to cause adverse impacts. You know, again, these are people vacationing. You have hundreds of people in a small spot vacationing. All these fires, all this, it does not take, you know, big partying or shooting off guns and fireworks and everything in order for this to be a significant impact for the people who live next door. It doesn't take uh, a lot of bad actors for, just to recognize the fact that you have now a lot more vehicles that are going to be coming and going, driving different places from here, uh, again, biking, uh, walking. It's an impact, even if everyone's behaving themselves. And the question is, is, do you, is it wise to put this kind of use, that kind of concentration of people, this kind of thing going on, it's outdoors, people talking, everything. When you're in the campground, what's peaceful and relaxing when you're talking with everybody sitting around your fire, the other air conditioners and other people doing the same thing aren't bothering you. When you're sleeping in your house or sitting out and, and just wanting to enjoy a quiet evening, that's what's going to bother you. That's the impact that it's going to have on the neighbors. So again, you know, you don't have to believe the campers are bad in order to understand that this is going to have a significant impact. Uh, and finally, just on, on some of these things, I think a good point was made that uh, when you look at some of the conditions, if you are going to approve this, for instance, um, you know, I would think about, okay, how are these uh, things, how are we going to ensure that, for instance, that the tree screening uh, gets maintained? Uh, so some things, if you're not looking at uh, some type of security, perhaps even uh, clauses to allow the county to go in and, and on notice if they don't replace dead trees or something the county can go in you have the power to do special charges uh, and assess the cost of replacing some trees you know just some ideas like that um, you know you want to make sure that you not just have an obligation but particularly where there's cost involved to follow that obligation that there is some mechanism by which you can assure that gets done because if 
you know, the money's not there, but all, you know, a whole bunch of the trees die, you know, those need to get replaced. And, and uh, you know, good intentions aren't going to do that. Uh, it's, it's, there needs to be something in place to make that happen. We have some pretty good monitors in our planning department. Though, so. <laughs> Well, I said it'll get noticed, but the question is, will it get done? That's why I said, you know, there's usually two ways that I, I've typically done with it. When I represent my municipalities, is either you, it's a bond or a letter of credit, or uh, in an agreement or conditions where uh, the city, village, town, county has the right to enter the property and cure the problem after notice, of course, uh, and then assess the cost as a special charge back to the property. Um, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lars. Schmidt. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Come on up. I didn't know if you saw it. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have the, the ability to go in and correct situations if it's not corrected? Sure. 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 Yeah. Yeah. We do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Schmidt. That would occur, that would occur if it comes to I'll make this real point, quick. It would occur through the long form sums and complaint. It'd be through violation procedures. Okay. All right. Like all right. right. Sorry to keep you going all the way this late and stuff like that. But I still book. did not hear. <laughs> I still did not hear how this system is going to handle the amount of fluid waste after six months, which is a that five hundred thousand gallon whatever, and well, that little small area. He compared it to some other systems that are out there, Southern. But Dark again, High that's comparing it. I'm worried about this system. Well, again, there's science, there's science to designing these systems. Southern Door, for example, uses over 15,000 uh, gallons a day. Okay, well, where does that go? How big of an area does that, is that? It's a size, it's, it's a sized uh, field for that um, situation. Okay. Southern Door School. Right? Yeah, okay, I understand that. But I don't know what the size of the, uh, septic field is for this system and what is the size of the septic field for the southern door system how big are they i mean you know they the could be the system's about a third of the size of what southern door has but see that the state gets involved with um, approving the, the system and so it will handle the waste that's being produced and then some okay well there is a, some sort of conflict here because i talked to chris olson and he said that the state was totally in charge of this system. And I gather from Mr. Pete or whatever his name is, um, he was saying that the county was in charge at the final say. Both entities. Both entities. Both entities are involved, both well, the county and the, and the state. I, I, the, the state, I think, approves the design of okay. the system, and the county um, mandates as an agent of the state is an agent of the state and the county mandates that if if a facility can perk then a septic system or mound system needs to be designed the county dislikes and will not we don't know for sure but we uh, assume that they will not approve holding tanks okay. the county has historically um, approved sites that perk with design systems such as this and so the planning department when we're dealing with it we have a checks and balance the county sanitarian has to approve before they'll issue a permit yeah, correct it'll go to for state approval first and then it comes back for the county sanitarian approval and we just don't issue any type of building <coughs> permit until they have both of those until both approvals. both approvals are in place both okay. the state and the county have to sign off okay well I would like I said I was in the sanitation department and uh, Chris Olson said it was totally up by the state they, he, he had nothing to do with it because he wrote down some notes and then he went somewhere and, and that was the end of it I think the state creates the standards that Chris has to, has well, to well, that, well I don't I don't know the exact process that would have Chris Olson or John Tiger with it exactly explain that. But I believe that with commercial systems or multifamily systems, those are reviewed by the state and those are approved by the state. The county is in charge of um, the management plan, for example, or installation and things like that. They're reviewing that. 
but the state is the sole reviewing body. <coughs> but again, I, you know, I'm, just, I'm still befuddled by this big amount of sewage that that little system is supposed to be handling, and the land area that it's going to be in is minute. I mean, I would take the whole 20 acres of land to handle it just in six months, you know, the 500,000 gallons of sewage. Okay, well, we have, we have all Pete's records um, okay. that will be submitted as part of the record as well, so we have an opportunity to review that and as we go into deliberations. If we don't understand something, we have the opportunity to, um, to ask for more information. But okay. Is there some way that you know, I could find out about what, what's going on or I, whatever yes. else like that? Because yeah. yes. this is a yeah. concern of mine. Since I'm so you close. Can go to the planning department and review this record at any time. Okay, planning department. Yeah. Okay. All right. Land, Indeed. Land use. Land use. Land land use sorry. Sorry. Land oh, yeah. Services. Sorry. The land is use that, department now, which is planning and zoning. And is that the same? It's in office is the same station. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank they you. merged together now. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you thank very you. much too. Okay, everyone. Um, sorry. Yeah. So sorry. No. Come on. No. Yep. Um, Kathy Knox, I just want to dispel a bit the, the idea the, the, that they're so far on, I think these people are probably very, very nice people. I don't know them and I don't want to hurt them in any way, but the idea that they're so far into this process that you can't stop them now, they went into this knowing this is a conditional use. This is not a guaranteed use that is allowed in this site in this location in this zone and so they went into it knowing they had to meet these conditions and I don't I no one has said anything that convinced me first of all that they can must determine that the proposed use at the proposed location will not be contrary to the public interest and will not be detrimental or injurious to the public health public safety or character of the surrounding area like end of story. I, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't see it. And I, there's at least three or four or five of these conditions. Someone could say that about your business just because it exists. You know how? That, that I don't know how. Same same reason as you said. What they say they believe is not injurious. Or they want to propose this. They've done everything to make sure that it's compatible with environmental safety and all those kinds of things, um, and you don't agree, that's pretty much what it is. Someone may not agree with your business. And, I mean, to elaborate sure. more, I mean, one of the things that, that, again, we're hearing this on a different basis from our normal process, but one of the things we're told when it comes to the public interest, it's not a matter of neighbors and people voicing their opinion. We're supposed to determine Okay, I mean, there's obviously overwhelming numbers of people that are, are, are objecting to this and think it's not in the public's interest, but, but we're not necessarily supposed to be listening to that it's a, a, pop, a you know, popularity vote, if you uh, will. No, I totally agree, but, the, but it's to, it should be related to the 14 conditions, right? Absolutely. I mean, yes. public, Absolutely. Interest, yes. public interest, I mean, it, can they prove that it will not negatively affect property values? I, can, I mean, it says it cannot have any detriment to vehicular or pedestrian access. I just, I mean, I, I think it has to come back to these 14 conditions, not who's nice people and has family here and... Um, and, and, I can and I can assure you that this board takes that challenge okay, that's all seriously. Right. Yeah. And what's really great about Door County, one of the things that's great about Door County planning and zoning and the county, um, the county fathers that set up this system is that applicants um, always have two kicks at the cat. That means you can go to the RPC mm -hmm. and if, you're, if somebody's aggrieved, um, Either the developer or aggrieved property owners can appeal to the Board of Adjustment. Mm -hmm. Many counties don't have that. They only have the Board of Adjustment and then it goes on to circuit court. Uh -huh. And so Door County is special in that manner that there is an opportunity for the public and as tedious and difficult as this yeah. process is, 
this is a in my opinion a much better process it's not to say that it's always going to stay this way because there's a lot of pressures external pressures coming from the state and put yourself in the position of the RPC if every time they're going to hear a hearing the potential for this to happen they go through the process and go well why are we doing this well, but, but they've created the process they've created us the resource planning committee in the county board has created us mm -hmm. and so um, we're not beholden we're not elected officials we're appointed and so that allows everybody to get fair representation I know I totally understand I sat on the Board of Appeals in the village of Egg Harbor sure. for years um, I understand but the concern is the RPC did not look at this they did not look at this well, and so I just want to make sure that's why we're here. and that's I know why that we that's, are here yeah that that's where this that that's where the decision is made on these 14 conditions and, and just to address that, I, I apologize if I was offensive in my response before, but it says um, whether a proposed project will adversely affect property values in the area. It does not say prove. It, they have to give testimony to what they're doing, and we have to decide if that would adversely affect property values well, or not. I, and we listen to them, and we listen sure. to you, and then we decide. But that's, that's how we go through these processes. There, there is not yet, there will be, um, but there is no um, uh, requirement that everyone brings in documentation. But you have and they have, so we have to compare those and see how it fits this project. Yeah. And, and, and I would add, Kathy, I mean, I, uh, again, we, you know, I can, at least from my standpoint, this is going to be one of the most difficult decisions I've I ever been involved with. But I mean, you're, for example, I think it's clear that we're all concerned about the safety issues, mm -hmm. the, the vehicular. But we've had testimony over here that boy, that everybody speeds and there's going to be there's going to be accidents. They're just waiting to happen. We've got a reporter who's saying, "I'm just waiting right to make the next report." We've got the other side that says, "We've checked the records. There's only been four accidents in five years in, in that area, sure. and they're all deer." So, I mean, you, you balance what you're hearing on both sides. You try to balance yeah. the facts with opinions, and it's it's not easy. But but that's what we try to do. So, right. so I mean, when you when you conclude that there is a safety issue. The other side doesn't think there's necessarily a safety issue or can be controlled. So I mean, those are the those are the challenges that we face, and we do the best we can. I, I totally understand. I just yeah. And thank and you. I really appreciate all of your work. I this is an extremely difficult job that you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then um, with that being said, I think we've heard from everybody else. Everybody feel like they've had their opportunity to be heard. Okay. Then at this point, um, I'd like to say good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I did poll my board members earlier because we got to the point of the night that we certainly are not going to deliberate tonight. Uh, what we are going to do, I'm going to read a brief statement here. The Door County Board of Adjustment will consider this matter at its meeting on Tuesday, May 1st. If you care to observe the proceedings, you may attend the Board of Adjustment meeting, which begins at 6.30 p.m. in the Peninsula Room, this room. The Board of Adjustment will not allow additional public testimony at its meeting, nor may any testimony, phone calls, letters, emails, etc., be offered to Board of Adjustment members before that meeting uh, next Tuesday. So, everybody understand that? We will meet here next Tuesday, 6.30, to deliberate. And, <clears throat> yeah, we won't be mailing out agendas there, to everyone. They're just <coughs> making time for that. So, and, okay, Counselor? No notices are going out. No notices are going out again. So. Just got our notice. Yeah, you just got your notice. <laughs> that was it. Okay? If you care to be here, you can be here at 6.30 on Tuesday. Um, and we will go through all the discussions will be amongst board members and staff.